So I'm going um, to be posting another uh, set of problems on the website on the weekend. So please look there for another set of uh, study questions slash practice problems that you can work your way through that will cover the rest of the material that we're going through this week. Today we're going to finish up chapter 8, talking about enzyme regulation. And what I want to do today is to really focus on three topics, enzyme cofactors, enzyme inhibitors, and allosteric regulation. And what we're going to see is that enzyme inhibition is uh, not just a, a theoretical uh, kind of thing. It actually is a very potent way that a lot of drugs work to inhibit enzymes that are involved in disease pathways, whether it's from uh, enzymes that are made by infectious agents or whether it's enzymes that are defective in the body. So it's actually pretty important to understand a little bit about the principles of enzyme inhibition so that you know something about how drugs work in the body. So this is just kind of an overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're first going to talk about cofactors. So these are typically small molecules. They could be metal ions. They could be other kinds of uh, organic molecules. And they basically help enzymes to function efficiently. They carry out typically essential activities within an enzyme. And without, a if an enzyme requires a cofactor, if that cofactor is not there or not there in sufficient quantities, then the enzyme typically doesn't function. Okay? So they're essential components of enzymes, but they're not actually part of the polypeptide itself. They're not covalently attached to the protein. Um, we're going to talk about enzyme inhibitors, and these can block enzyme activity through three different distinct kinds of mechanisms. And we'll talk about all three briefly today. One is competitive inhibition, the second is non-competitive inhibition, and the third is uncompetitive inhibition. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about what each of those are and what that means in terms of the way that the inhibitor is interacting with the enzyme um, during, the, a catalytic during or before a catalytic reaction. And then finally, um, we're going to talk about allosteric changes, which basically involve structural changes that are induced uh, on an in or on an enzyme that affect its ability to catalyze a reaction. They might affect its ability to bind to a substrate, or they might affect its ability to interact with some other molecule that it has to bind to um, during uh, its, its reaction, such as maybe a cofactor. All right, so let's, let's go back to, we were talking last time a bit about the induced fit model of enzyme catalysis. So this was a, an idea that was put forward initially by Dan Koshland back uh, when he was first working on enzyme kinetics back in the 50s and 60s. Um, so Dan was a very long time faculty member here in MCB. And, um, and the idea of the induced fit model is basically that the en an enzyme structure is not a rigid, uh, is not a rigid structure, right? It's something that is, has a lot of dynamic properties, such that when it initially encounters a substrate, there might be initially a fairly weak uh, interaction with the substrate. But upon um, that initial encounter, the conformation of the active site or the binding site for the substrate is induced to change, such that it becomes um, much more, uh, much, a much better fit for the substrate. So there's a much higher affinity interaction that gets induced upon association, initial sort of encounter between the enzyme and the substrate. And that's shown in this cartoon right here, where we have a substrate that is uh, entering an active site of an enzyme, and there's initially a fairly weak association, but there's a, this, these, uh, these weak interactions induced conformational changes that create a uh, higher affinity interaction here, leading to conversion of substrate to product, and then product association. All right? And so um, I think it's an important property to think about, just not to, not to envision substrates as sort of a lock and key uh, kind of interaction, where you have a preformed, uh, rigid uh, conformation. But in fact, there's lots of evidence that many enzymes work instead by having this ability to interact weakly with substrates initially, and then upon conformational change induced by that initial encounter, uh, form a tighter interaction with the substrate. Of course, it can't be too tight as we talked about last time, right, where actually the enzyme wouldn't be a very effective enzyme. So, uh, so cofactors are very commonly used in enzymes. And these tend to be, uh, they're, they're non-protein uh, components of enzymes. And, um, and they could be either inorganic or organic. So they could be metal ions, um, but they also could be small organic molecules that interact um, in a very specific place on the enzyme. And sometimes we call organic cofactors a coenzyme. So you might hear that uh, word as well, coenzyme, something that is essential for the function of an enzyme. And without it, the enzyme can't actually carry out its reaction. A lot of coenzymes, for example, include vitamins. So one of the reasons that we need vitamins is that they're actually required for carrying out many of the enzymatic reactions that occur in metabolism. So um, they're basically able to bind to uh, metabolic enzymes and um, help them to interact with substrates, interact with other proteins, et cetera, and are in that way essential for metabolism without being actually covalently attached to the polypeptide itself. Now, um, it turns out that cofactors can also be required in ribozymes, right? So they're not just required in protein enzymes. They're also required sometimes in ribozymes. And I wanted to show you one example of this. So this is an example from our own work um, in which we were looking at a, uh, the, uh, a reaction that is catalyzed by this RNA molecule, which is a ribozyme. It folds up into a structure that's shown here, where the 5' prime end of the RNA is down uh, in this region right here of the molecule, and it snakes all the way around and forms this uh, highly folded structure. C term, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, 3' prime end of the RNA is here. So 5' prime end is here, 3' prime end is here. And um, the active site of this RNA is right here. And the, and the reaction that it catalyzes is cleavage of a specific phosphodiester bond in the RNA backbone. And so the structure of this molecule is such that only that one particular phosphodiester bond in the RNA gets cut. No other, no other, uh, other uh, bond is positioned correctly in the active site to get cleaved. But of course, um, how does that chemistry actually happen? And it turns out that um, there's a metal ion, and we can actually see it right here in this uh, uh, little snapshot close-up of the electron density map for this molecule. So what you're looking at here is in this mesh is the actual electron density that we can calculate for this, uh, this molecule using um, X-ray crystallography. And then what you're seeing uh, inside that mesh is a molecular model that's built into that electron density map based on chemical principles. So we know uh, what the bond lengths and bond angles are for RNA, and so we can fit a model into the electron density map such that it is consistent with what we actually observe experimentally. And so that's what you're seeing here. And then uh, it was very interesting that when we did this, we could see very clear density, so sort of this, this ball of density in the center, uh, right in the active site, that did not correspond to any atoms of the RNA itself. It actually corresponds to density from a magnesium ion, so it's a divalent ion that's sitting right there in the active site. And so this is a cofactor for this enzyme, for this ribosome, actually required to carry out uh, the chemistry of the reaction. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes uh, an experiment that was done to actually test that idea, because it could, you know, starts out as a hypothesis, right? You see something like that, and you say, hey, maybe that, maybe that metal ion is required for catalysis. It's certainly in a very tantalizing location right there near the, uh, near the bond that's actually being cleaved in the active site, but that, has to be, that idea has to be tested. And I'll show you in a few moments how that was tested. And then let me just show you uh, this, which is a little um, movie. So it turned out to be for this RNA, it turned out to be possible to crystallize the RNA in the, in the, in the before and after state. So we could crystallize it before the, the uh, cleavage reaction had occurred in the RNA, and then we could crystallize it after the cleavage reaction had occurred. And look at the changes in the electron density map in the before and after states, and build models into the, those maps, and then compare the structures. And so what you're going to see is a little uh, movie that is a morphing between the before state and the after state of this reaction. Let's, hopefully this works. <laughs> 
right? So there's the cleavage, and then you see what, what happens is the active site rearranges, and this metal ion actually gets ejected from the active site. So after the cleavage reaction, there was no evidence for a metal ion remaining in the active site based on the electron density map. And so the idea was that this conformational change that happens in the enzyme ejects this cofactor. It gets kicked out, right? And that's one of the ways that this uh, enzyme is able to, this ribozyme, is able to, um, is, is able to release its product as well, is, to, is, to, uh, is through this conformational change. Now this is not a, this is actually a, a, um, a, a we can call it a, I guess we can call it certainly a ribozyme, um, but it's not a catalyst in, in the traditional sense in that it accelerates the rate of this cleavage reaction at a specific site, but after one reaction, it doesn't uh, catalyze another reaction, right? The cleavage has occurred within the RNA. This conformational change happens and it's done. And this is, actually has to do with the biology of where this ribozyme is found. It's found in a virus where part of the viral life cycle is to cleave the RNA at this site, and then that allows the virus to be packaged and, and to um, form more infectious agents, okay? All right, so back to cofactors. So, um, a lot of times these cofactors are very tightly bound in the enzyme. They're not actually covalently bound, but they may be so tightly associated that the only way to get the cofactor out of the enzyme would be to actually uh, denature the enzyme. You might have to boil it, or you might have to extract it with organic solvents or something like that that would end up disrupting the structure of the protein. And for cofactors like that, they're so tightly bound, we call them prosthetic groups because they're just it's sort of like a, like a prosthesis, right? It's, it's essentially a, it's, it's a part of the enzyme that is necessary for the enzyme to actually fold up and, and, and um, carry out its, its reaction. More loosely bound cofactors we call coenzymes, as we mentioned before. And if we have an enzyme that lacks an essential cofactor, we can call it an apoenzyme. Um, an apoenzyme. So that means that an enzyme, it might be an enzyme that, uh, that uh, it might still have some of the the structures or, or, or sort of have a structure that's close to the structure required for it to carry out catalysis, but it's not actually functional unless it has the cofactor associated with it. And then finally, um, if we have complete enzyme that has cofactors associated, we often call that a holoenzyme. That means that, we, that everything's there that's necessary to bind substrates and to um, catalyze reactions. Now, interestingly, a lot of the cofactors that we find in biology um, have, uh, have a related structure or a related structural feature. So I don't know how many of you took a look at this beforehand, or maybe you've seen this before, but does anybody see what's the, what's the, common, uh, what's the common molecule here in all these cofactors? Yeah, but it's, uh, there's something else. We, we talked about it last time in class. Anybody see it? ATP, right? ATP. So um, if you look up here, so each of these actually might not be the triphosphate, but certainly the adenosine, right? So we have here's the here's the adenine ring, here it is down here, and then here it is over here. It's hooked up through a glycosidic bond to the ribose. There's the ribose there, there, and there, and then the ribose has um, in each case uh, here a couple of phosphates on it, right? And then it's got an additional functional group here that makes this either coenzyme A or NAD or FAD. Right? And so what's really, really kind of cool in evolution is that many enzymes have evolved to use cofactors like this that, have, that share this chemical feature. They all have ATP as part of the cofactor structure itself. So um, why is that? Well, you know, we don't really know, but it seems like uh, in, in evolution, probably um, adenosine or the, certainly the adenine ring was something that, was, that is very, it's a very ancient kind of organic molecule. It's been around for a long time. And um, as enzymes have evolved over time, they've, they've built on that uh, sort of core structure to utilize other kinds of molecules that are, that are based on, on the structure of adenine or adenosine. And so you might imagine that because of that, there's going to be some shared properties in enzymes that allow them to all recognize um, features of the adenine ring or adenosine itself, and that's actually true. And so what we see is that, um, for, this is just an example over here, many proteins that bind to, uh, to the adenine ring or to, to cofactors that include it have what's called a Rossman fold, which is shown over here. They have this very characteristic structure in the polypeptide. And by the way, that polypeptide sequence doesn't always have to be the same, right? We can form this three-dimensional structure from different uh, polypeptide sequences that have some uh, amino acids in common, but they can all form this fold that recognize uh, the adenine ring. And, um, and I, don't want, I don't want you to think that every enzyme that recognizes an adenine ring has a Rossman fold. That's not the case, but, but, but a fair number of them do. And then there's other kinds of structural uh, features that are conserved in other enzymes that use these cofactors as well. So we see um, a number of examples of uh, structures that have evolved to recognize cofactors that are then used over and over in different families of enzymes, clearly showing at a molecular level how these molecules have been uh, related evolutionarily. Right, and we'll talk more about this uh, when we get into metabolism, but um, this is a molecule, NADH, that's reversibly oxidized during electron transport in many cells. Okay, so it's one of the fundamental cofactors in metabolism. And as we said, many enzymes have common structural features that allow them to bind to this cofactor. So um, we've been talking about enzyme activity, and, and one of the things that's, that's really critical biologically is that these enzymes are regulated. So they're not just in cells uh, willy-nilly catalyzing reactions. They're actually very highly and uh, tightly controlled in most cases. So um, you can imagine that you know, chemical chaos would happen if these, were not, uh, these pathways were not carefully controlled. And so there's lots of mechanisms that have evolved to make sure that enzymes are functioning just when they're needed and just at the levels at which their uh, products are actually required in cells. And the way that this often happens is by switching on or off the genes that encode specific enzymes. That's one way. Or alternatively, cells can directly regulate the activity of enzymes after they've already been made. So their, their overall concentration might remain the same, but there might be ways of controlling them chemically. And you could imagine different ways of doing that. For example, covalent modification by phosphorylation. We talked a little bit about that last time. Another way is to have binding proteins that bind to enzymes and sequester them so they not, they're not able to interact with their substrates. And then a third way is to have inhibitory or sometimes activating molecules that are separate from the enzyme that can bind reversibly and affect uh, either, uh, increase or decrease the activity of the enzyme. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of these mechanisms here. And I first want to tell you uh, about feedback inhibition. This is a, um, a very classical mechanism by which a lot of metabolic enzymes are controlled in, uh, in the cell. And the way that this works is that sort of, sort of the fundamental property of this is that if we have a metabolic pathway that goes from a starting uh, substrate to a, ultimately to a product through a series of enzymes that are catalyzing each step in a reaction pathway, um, very classically, in, in feedback inhibition, what we find is that the end product of that pathway is an inhibitor of one of the early steps in the pathway. It could be the first enzyme or the second enzyme. It's typically not the last enzyme, right? Because it's actually more energetically efficient to inhibit uh, one of the early uh, enzymes in the pathway. And so what this does is to basically prevent a cell from wasting resources by synthesizing more of a particular product than it requires at a, at a given time. And this is a figure that shows um, that sort of outlines how this works. And so the idea is that we have, this is a metabolic pathway in which we're converting one amino acid, threonine, into a second amino acid, isoleucine. And this is happening through a series of five enzymes that, uh, that convert the starting material in steps all the way down here to the product. And so we have these five enzymes. And um, 
if, if this were, you know, this sort of pathway is, is this sort of, uh, you know, full, going full bore, uh, cranking out the product, eventually we get a buildup of isoleucine, or we could. And when that happens, and the cell uh, has a lot of this material around, this actually has the ability to bind to a site in, uh, the, uh, in the first enzyme of the pathway here. And it binds in such a way that this enzyme activity is now inhibited. And so um, when this activity is inhibited, then of course there's not as much of the second intermediate, or, or I guess the intermediate A here that's getting made. And so then there's not as much uh, material for enzyme 2 to use to convert to enzyme B, uh, intermediate B, et cetera, and we get a reduction in the production of isoleucine. And then over time, if that happens uh, for, for long enough, then the stores of isoleucine might be depleted. And when that happens, then there's not as much isoleucine around to bind as an inhibitor to enzyme 1. And so we don't get as much inhibition, and the whole pathway cranks back up again. Right? So it's a very nice way for the cell to use the product of a pathway to prevent unnecessary production of a particular molecule until it's actually needed in the cell. And so that brings us to the subject of, of inhibition and, and how, they, how these types of inhibitors work. And, um, and so, as I mentioned at the beginning, we can think about inhibition in, as working in three basic and, and distinct ways in terms of the way that these molecules can interact with an enzyme and um, inhibit its activity in a pathway or just in a, in a particular reaction. So um, the first way is through competitive inhibition. And that's just like it sounds, right? It basically means that we have an inhibitor whose chemical structure is often very similar to the chemical structure of the substrate for the reaction. And because of that, it means that that inhibitor can actually bind in the same site on the enzyme, in the active site, in the substrate binding site on the enzyme. And when it does, it prevents the enzyme from interacting with its actual, uh, actual substrate. So it's just a direct competitive interaction. Now, sometimes these inhibitors that are competitive can actually bind with higher affinity to the enzyme than the affinity that the enzyme has for its substrate. And sometimes they bind with lower affinity, but they're just present in a high concentration. So they tend to outcompete just because there's more of it around, right? And things are interacting through, uh, you know, uh, diffusion. And more often, the enzyme will run into the inhibitor if it's just around in higher concentration. And I drew a, I wanted to just point, uh, direct you to this um, representation right here. It's a nice way to think about inhibition, uh, and in this case, competitive inhibition, where we have a very simple equation for an enzyme-catalyzed reaction, and we've seen this now uh, several times in class, right? We have an enzyme uh, and a substrate coming together to form an enzyme-substrate complex. Chemistry happens here. We get conversion to product, and then release of the product over here. And of course, all of these, um, all of these interactions are um, uh, reversible, right? They're all reversible. Um, and we have a competitive inhibitor around. That means that the inhibitor is also able to bind to the enzyme, just like the substrate can. And if it does, it forms an enzyme inhibitor complex that effectively blocks the enzyme from doing anything else because it can't bind to the substrate, right? So there's direct uh, inhibition there. And again, um, when we have a competitive inhibitor, it typically looks a lot like the substrate molecule for that reaction. Um, and then, okay, then let's, let's talk a little bit about non-competitive inhibitors. So these are uh, molecules that will typically bind to a different site on the enzyme. And when that happens, uh, the enzyme is no longer able to carry out the reaction. And so with non-competitive inhibitors, um, we can look uh, down here at this representation of what's happening in terms of the, the en enzyme-catalyzed reaction. We have a non-competitive inhibitor. We have an inhibitor that can bind to the enzyme, and it can actually bind to it either before or after the enzyme has interacted with the substrate, right? Because it's not a competitive inhibitor. It's not binding the same site as the, uh, as, as a competitive, as the substrate would bind. And so because of that, we can write this kind of representation where we have the enzyme um, binding to, to substrate here, or it can bind to an inhibitor and form an enzyme-inhibitor complex, which could still bind to substrate because the substrate uh, binding site is not, uh, not blocked directly by a competitive inhibitor. But when, when that happens, in either case, we form this, uh, this complex here that has, might, might have substrate bound or might not, uh, but it has an inhibitor bound. And when that inhibitor is bound, the enzyme is effectively inactivated. I see a question in the back. It, these are all reversible interactions. Uh, I couldn't quite hear that, but I, but I think it's important. I think you're asking about inhibition. Yeah. I mean, if you had a huge concentration of product, then sure, it could go, you know, that could push the equilibrium back the other way, right? If you had a huge amount of product. Sure, so yeah, absolutely. So you could have, right, we could have no inhibitor around, and we just have so much product that's built up that, you know, we effectively slow down the reaction because we're just driving the equilibrium the other way. Is that, is that what you're saying? Okay. Sorry, it's a little hard to hear down here. Um, but, but, I, but I do want everyone to understand that these are always reversible interactions, right? So when we're talking about this kind of inhibitor, now sometimes, um, you know, you might imagine a what we call a suicide inhibitor, okay, if you've heard of that. A suicide inhibitor is something that might form an actual covalent bond with an enzyme, okay, so that it's actually effectively not reversible, right? I mean, it might be if you waited long enough, but it's effectively not reversible. And then you, you know, that's sort of a different mechanism where you have something that's literally covalently changing the enzyme and, and pulling it out of the out of the population of molecules that are functional. Okay, but that's not what we're talking about here. Here we're talking about reversible interactions, and I just want you to know that non-competitive inhibitors um, don't necessarily look like the substrate, and they don't tend to bind to the same site as the substrate. They bind somewhere else, and they might do, uh, do something like change the conformation of the enzyme so that it doesn't work very well anymore. All right, and then um, uncompetitive inhibitors are uh, sort of a, an extreme example of that, where we have a molecule that only binds to the enzyme-substrate complex, and when that happens, again, it forms a, an inactive complex here with the enzyme-substrate complex such that it can't carry out chemistry. All right, and then let's just look at a couple of examples of this. So. Um, this is, a, uh, this is a picture, so there's been a lot of research into how antibiotic drugs work. So you might have wondered, you know, how, how is it that when I take uh, penicillin or you know, many, many other kinds of antibiotics, tetracycline, um, other drugs that, that we're all familiar with if we've had any kind of infection, and it turns out that many of these antibiotics function as competitive inhibitors of the ribosome, okay? And the way that we know this is by, is, and, how they, and, how, and 